And here we go. Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to another one of our explanations videos. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic, and I had a, a request from a, a gentleman to explain a little bit about what's known as postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, aka POTS, and in particular, its relationship to what's going on in the upper part of the neck. So first and foremost, what is this POTS syndrome? Well, it belongs in a, a category of disorders that are known as dysautonomia. And what that means is it means that something is not working right with your autonomic nervous system. This is the stuff that coordinates your heart, your lungs, your digestion, your reproduction, and also the regulation of blood throw, blood flow, excuse me, to and through all different parts of your body. And as a general rule, there are two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. There is the sympathetic division, and that's going to be your overgeneralized fight, flight, freeze reflexes. It controls blood vessel dilation. And so it is going to be associated also then and has a lot of times with the terms of a person in terms of their fear perception anxiety perception, and also a sense of balance and coordination. Your other one, so your parasympathetic, this is going to be involved with repair, rest, digest. And these two elements, they should be working, you know, to a certain degree like a yin-yang kind of thing in what's known as a biurnal relationship. And so what this means is it means that it's not always 50% one or 50% the other. It means that there's times where you need more of one and you need less of the other. And then you need more of the other, less of the original. And then there's times where you need a little bit more of both and a little bit less of both. The thing about it is in order for your autonomic nervous system to be working correctly, it means that the normal flow of those life messages between your brain and to all of the centers of the body are coordinated. That is, the right kind of information is capable of flowing properly, and there's no interference to that function. And the second thing is that the quality of those messages is appropriate. So let me take just a, a quick little step back here. As an example, if you are having to run and flee for your life, well, what do you need? You need for your heart to start pumping faster and start pumping more blood, nuts to whatever you're digesting for lunch, to your legs and to your arms so that you can go. That's the normal response. But imagine is if your body, something says, oh, no, we don't really need to focus on that. Or imagine that instead you're trying to sleep and instead your body produces this kind of a response. That is what we are referring to in terms of dysautonomia. And the potential combinations of different symptoms and presentations that individuals could experience is so broad that we have to give it this label, this category of disorders, rather than trying to put individualized labels because you'd be looking at an infinite number of possible combinations in the body. So understanding then that this is the, the nature of what we're talking about here, where does this postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome come into? Okay, well, let's break down the words there. So firstly, postural or positional sometimes is also called. It has something to do with your human posture. And as people, we're typically we're going to be referring to an upright position orthostatic what this is also adding to this is referring to again that upright position and also everything working correctly tachycardia heart going faster so what's happening for people when diagnosed with POTS when they are not just sitting but particularly when they're standing their heart starts to beat faster for seemingly no good reason now, nothing happens in the body unless there's a reason for it. But for some reason, their heart rate starts going up. Now, the problem with this, and there's a series of problems, is number one, when the heart starts going up, you actually get diminished normal you know, volume going out from the heart. 
And so what happens is the heart starts beating faster. It actually becomes ever so slightly less efficient at pumping blood to all parts of your body, including oh so many of the terrible important ones, your brain. What also happens then in terms of how your body then tries to say, okay, hey, the blood, or excuse me, the heart rate's going up. We need to make sure then so that we don't stroke out, we decrease the blood pressure. So the lining of the vessels is going to become just a, a little bit more, um, more um, dilated. Actually, it'd be a little bit more dilated, a little bit more constricted. Excuse me, it would dilate just a, a little bit to make sure that you're not going to be having too much uh, tension, too much pressure. But the consequence of this then is it sends an abnormal feedback loop back to your brain. Your brain is saying, what? Why is this going on? All that we did was stand up. And yet the sensation that you are experiencing is quite very real. Again, what do people who experience POTS characteristically describe? They feel faint. They feel dizzy, like they are rocking or all over the place. Oftentimes, they describe brain fog. They say, it feels like my heart is going super fast. They feel like they're going to pass out. And if it gets severe enough, then yes, person will actually faint. And I've seen cases where it is so pronounced, so severe, a person can't even lift their head up off the ground. And even then, lying flat down is still very significant challenge and struggle. So we're not talking about a, a very pleasant, a very nice syndrome or a condition here at all. We're talking about something that is extremely disruptive to a person's ability to, in all honesty, do just about anything. Now, I'm going to make a quick little distinction here because you go back five years, nobody except for, you know, a very advanced neurologist would have ever heard of something called a POTS syndrome. And yet it seems to become a, an, becoming an increasingly frequent issue. Now, I honestly don't know the reason why that is, but I do need to make a, a quick little distinction between this POTS syndrome and then what is also known as orthostatic intolerance okay so let me back up just a, a wee little step here when a person is going from a lying down to a seated or in particular a standing position what is supposed to happen is that their blood pressure is supposed to rise by a certain amount if it doesn't or if it doesn't happen fast enough whoa a person's gonna say I'm feeling lightheaded when I sit up too fast. But imagine that that sensation then never goes away. This is what's known as orthostatic intolerance. It again is a form of dysautonomia. But a lot of times people who are experiencing orthostatic intolerance are diagnosed having a, a POTS syndrome. When the hallmark of partial orthostatic tachycardia is the tachycardia. You see, just because you stand up and feel dizzy, it doesn't necessarily mean that your heart is necessarily beating abnormally. It just means you're feeling all of the same kind of symptoms with that one exception. So it's a, a subtle little difference in terms of the, the diagnostic you know, criteria. But one way or another, what's the most important thing, in all honesty, it's not necessarily whatever you choose to call it. POTS, orthostatic intolerance, dysautonomia, just in general. The question is, what is causing it and what can you do about it? Now, the honest answer, nobody has all of the answers when it comes to dysautonomic condition. There seems to be elements of diet. So a common one, and you know, I'm not a nutritionist, this isn't personal advice, that if a person is actually feeling, you know, too faint, is always check blood pressure, normal resting blood pressure. And this is a very basic litmus test, the lick test. Lick the back of your hand. Ideally, when you don't have hand lotion on, do that and tell me what you taste. You should taste just a little bit of salt. See, so many different medications or even things along the lines of delightful coffee that they ultimately cause you to lose not just your water, but also your salt. And if a person is deficient in salt for any reason, that's the battery acid that's going to be necessary for their body to go. If you do not taste just a wee little bit of saltiness when you're doing that, guess what? 
you're going to be deficient in your salt, and that can possibly be one of the contributing factors. Another big one is going to be hormone regulation. I'm not even going to pretend that I understand all of that, but you can appreciate how hormones then are very much influenced by your physiology. It's everything that you eat, everything you put on your skin, everything you drink, everything that goes into your lungs. All of the different things that influence any number of hormones have the potential to feed into this POTS syndrome. Beyond that, there's also the genetic and the epigenetic component. And this is where it starts getting really, really challenging. Never a guarantee, but some people, because of their genetics, because of the anatomy that they inherit, their margin of error for developing these kinds of conditions is less. It's never a guarantee. Just because you may have a certain gene for a certain condition does not mean that you're guaranteed to get it, but it does mean that there is a greater likelihood. And in particular, and this is where it starts getting real crazy, is when you start adding into the effect of memory and inherited memory on mitochondrial DNA and then how that plays out in terms of a person's ability to function. So if you would visualize a inherited PTSD, we can appreciate that this gets very, very tricky. I mean, the nature of any kind of dysautonomic condition is where your body is effectively playing a trick on your brain. Everything that you are experiencing is 100% real. But in terms of looking to identify, well, what's the solitary lesion? What's the solitary organic pathology? A good chunk of the time, it's not there to be seen. Similar to how, if whatever device you're looking at this, uh, this video on, if you've got a crack in the screen, you know it's quite evident what the problem is. But let's say that you've got malware on your device. It still will affect how you're going to be able to watch this. But a lot of the number of tests are going to say, no, 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 from the outside, everything looks normal. So imagine if you would that it's like, no, 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 something is affecting the way that your system is functioning. And it's affecting it potentially at multiple different levels. Now, the particular focus then in the video here, not just explaining all of the other contributing factors, but having a look then, you know, what's the relationship and the role of the health of the person's upper neck? And it has to do with two, arguably three, very important structures. Number one is the vagus nerve. Number two is what's called the superior sympathetic ganglion. And the third one is your brain stem itself, what's called your medulla. So what do we got here? We've got a big giant blow up model of the base of your skull, the top vertebrae in your neck, the C1, the C2, the C3. This is the front, this is the back. Now the vagus nerve, this is the primary nerve pathway that sends information from your brain to all, all, all of your internal organs and also sends all of the information back. And what it does is it transmits through the very front base of your skull here and it actually lies down along the front of these vertebrae that are in your neck. Now, in addition to that, you've also got a structure that's going to be located approximately here, just in front of the C2 and the C3 vertebra. It's known as a superior cervical ganglion. And what this is, is this is a nerve cluster that sends all of the sympathetic, remember we said sympathetic is another one of those uh, divisions of the um, autonomic nervous system. It sends messages that ultimately regulates blood flow in all, all, all parts of your brain. Not just the arterial flow, but also the lymphatic circulation. And again, it sits located right about here. Now, the ray and then the neck has the potential to influence these two structures is an emergent problem that we're seeing even in younger and younger and younger kids. And it is this. It's forward head posture, and posture is not simply a matter of laziness. A person's posture is a reflection of their underlying state of health. You see, your brain's not weak and your body's not stupid. 
It's not going to do something to deliberately cause issues or problems. But if a person A has ever had a head or neck injury that causes something to shift and get locked out of position, whether or not it was broken or dislocated, and then if and when you compound that with repetitive daily stresses that involve either A, the traditional way, looking down in a book, or B, the way that we have it now, looking in front of a computer or playing too much games, or even worse, being in front of a phone all day. What this does is this has the tendency to cause and actually produces a forward shift movement in the vertebrae in your neck. Now what this does is this can actually encroach, stretch and become a source of irritation to the vital nerves in that area of your body. Now again, your brain's not stupid, your body's not weak. Every single person with their head coming forward is not going to experience dysautonomia. But remember what we said, that there are a certain percent of people that through their genetics, anatomy, or just wrong set of circumstances, their margin of error is a lot less. For these people, if and where you've got that forward head shift this way, what it can do is it can start to stretch, impinge, irritate these particular nerves. So you imagine if I'm poking you in your arm like this, what are you going to do besides punch me? You're going to lean away. So what happens is when you see a person's posture with their head coming forward like this, oftentimes you'll also see the jaw go backwards. And the consequence of that is going to narrow up, narrow down on their airway. But if that neck still has nowhere else to go, it can only compensate for so much. There comes a point where your body just can't compensate anymore and then bang, it's like somebody flicks a switch. And suddenly what you thought was just, you know, a little posture issue or you thought was just some tight muscles or you thought it was just a little bit stress, suddenly, again, because your body's playing a trick on your brain, you're experiencing dizziness. You're experiencing severe anxiety and you're experiencing all of the other scary things that go with that. Now, in addition to that, because remember I said that there's going to be three ways that your upper neck can has a, a role on this. The other one is on the brain stem itself. And the reason for that is because if you were to look top down, so again, this is back, this is front, this is where your brain stem sits. And this is the master control center for all of the autonomic functions in your body. If you have irritation because something up here has again shifted, gotten locked, you've got a series of ligaments that can literally exert abnormal mechanical tension in that area directly into the brain stem and start to affect these vital life centers. And when that happens, I mean, some of the, the common things that people experience with that, headaches, migraines, because interesting, migraine is associated with the vagus nerve dysfunction. You can also experience various forms of neuralgias, sore, achy muscles. But again, one of the other consequences of this is that you can start to develop these dysautonomic kinds of conditions. So what we're talking about here then, again, is where there is a physical origin to this particular kind of syndrome. And what we're proposing here as one possibility is where those top vertebrae in your neck have gotten shifted, they've gotten injured, they've gotten stuck, they've gotten locked out of the normal position. And unfortunately, then they're producing a constant amount of pressure or irritation that's causing dysfunction in the body. And so what one of the solutions then requires a very precise correction into that area. And this does not involve using a, a whole lot of force. I will say that first and foremost. And the reason for that is because many people who do experience POTS, orthostatic intolerance, or any form of dysautonomia, they also experience what's known as increased neurosensitivity. And so what this is, is this is where, you know, imagine if you would, you haven't slept for five days and all of your nerves are just on edge, no matter what you have going on. So if you start trying to give a person too much stimulation, too much of even a good thing, their body's just going to stone cold reject it and they're very likely going to get spiraled up into a tizzy, everything feeling also terribly much worse. 
So for people with POTS, what it requires first is an in-depth analysis to find out what the major contributing factors are in terms of what's going on for you on an individual basis. Is there potentially a genetic component? Is there potentially a dietary or a chemical component? Is there a TMJ or a dental component? Is there a lower back component? And then the very important one, is there an upper neck component? And if so, in exactly what direction, location, and degree is that actually going on? Because the last thing that you would want is be to work, be working in the right area, but in the wrong direction, because that's just going to cause everything to get, you know, stirred, agitated. As much as I would like then to say that, you know, when working with people in a, a upper neck and up, upper cervical kind of a perspective, that it's always straightforward, especially when you're dealing with dysautonomic conditions, again, including a pause. This is much more like trying to unparallel park between two cars when you've got about that much room, one side versus the other and where it's almost like the game of operation where there's little buzz things that go on one side or the other if you go even just that little little bit too far and this is one of the reasons why you're watching this video it's probably because you've been online you're trying to look for some research you're trying to figure out you know what's exactly going on and everybody has different perspectives because a nobody has it all figured out yet i know i certainly don't we each have one piece of the puzzle and we wish so much we could make it easier so that's like, yeah, yeah, just snap of the fingers boom problem solved and unfortunately it would seem the reality is is that it's much more of a complex kind of condition and what triggers it we don't always know but it's sometimes like trying to put the genie back in the bottle much much easier said than done but then important to understand that first, if you think that you're looking for just that one magic thing, it probably doesn't exist. But number two, you have to make sure that the team of individuals who you are working with, they know that A, less is more, and B, whatever form of care you do is personalized for you so that it's going to be able to give you the best possible chance of actually getting a resolution for what you're experiencing so that you can get back to enjoying all of the different things in life that you enjoy. So hopefully you did enjoy this uh, explanations video a little bit longer than I was originally anticipating it to be, my apologies. Um, but nevertheless, hopefully you found it uh, valuable and informative. So if you did, first and foremost, we always ask you to click the like and subscribe button so that other people can find this video who need to find it. Secondly is if you found this video and you're thinking, okay, there's somebody, a friend, a family member who needs to watch this, please do share this with them. And then last but certainly not least is if you are experiencing what we've been describing here and you're thinking that sounds like me, then I'm going to have you reach out to us. Be happy to help out in any capacity that we can, again, so that you can get back to living life the, the way that uh, you want. Hopefully, again, you enjoyed watching this video. We'll see you next time. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic. Be well, live well, stay well. Take care.